There will not be anymore a car that comes with the specific functions and will be sold for five years. The car will be upgraded and updated over time and over lifetime. These cars will be continually updated. So the software we're developing will never be done. We'll always be improving it, making it better, and putting software updates out there. So it really changes that relationship. The biggest, the biggest saving, saving is obviously, is obviously the, driver. the driver. No matter, no matter what, what market you're in, the biggest, biggest saving is the driver. Is the driver. Welcome back to part two of the IAA Mobility Visionary Club chat about the future business models behind autonomous driving. If you missed part one of our chat, go back and check it out. Here in part two, we are diving deep into the business models of the future for autonomous vehicles, for private consumers, but also for robo taxis and robo shuttles. I've got a great panel here to break it all down with me. Let me introduce them. I am joined here by Danny Shapiro. He's the VP of Automotive at NVIDIA. Danny, welcome. Thanks, it's great to be here. Paul Thomas is the CTO at P3, a mobility service company. Paul, welcome. It's great to be here with the IA. And joining us virtually, we have Thomas Danaman. He's the Senior Director of Product Marketing at Qualcomm. Thomas, thank you. Great to be here talking about Qualcomm Automotive Technologies. All right, we have an exciting chat, but before we talk about business cases, let's talk about what we all are first and foremost, consumers. As a consumer, a quick question, would you rather pay for AD functionality once or choose it on demand when you need it? Jenny, it's a, go ahead. It's a great question. I think consumers are going to need to face this themselves. We're working with automakers to create the software-defined car, meaning it can do different things for different people and software updates will give new features. So I think the consumer is going to be really happy to select and customize their experience and it may be you pay a little bit now and you, you pay later when you're using new features. Do I hear you saying both? Pay twice? Well, you would buy the car first at yeah. a base level, and then if you want to add things to it, you have the freedom and flexibility to do that. So the car will get better over time. Okay, well, improvement sounds good. How about you? Slightly different perspective from the mobility as a service side, because we want autonomy to be on all the time because of the safety and efficiencies it brings to the to the industry and to the consumer itself. You know, and it stops that one car being parked in a car park for most of the day, even with all of the autonomy kit on, which somebody's paid for, when it could be out there doing something else and not taking up that space. All right, the same question to you, Thomas. As a consumer, would you rather choose AD functionality as an option once or pay on demand as you need it? I think I would uh, pay right away for the full set because I'm a very technology guy and I'm always curious to test things and not just to have them only on a specific use case. So I would like to have them always on and always available. Like always, also our technology, we are always connected and want to have always the best user experience. So all full in. All right, all in. Let's dive right into business models, shall we? AD is bringing new players to the autonomous industry, to the automotive industry. If we look for just a second at the supply side, what is the future envisioned business case for suppliers? Where, where do you see this going? I think the, the word supplier is kind of old school. Okay. Uh, right. It used to be a, a company would make a chip and they would sell it to a tier one and the tier one would put something and integrate it together and sell it to the car maker. Um, right now we work as partners, partners with the car not suppliers. makers. That's right. We're developing technology. We bring computers, we bring software, um, we bring the whole process, the development process to the customer, our customer, meaning the, the automaker or the truck maker, and it is then uh, an ongoing relationship that will last years, if not decades. These cars will be continually updated, so the software we're developing will never be done. We'll always be improving it, making it better, and putting software updates out there. So it really changes that relationship. Thomas, what's your view? I fully concur with Danny on this. So uh, we are going to develop a complete platform so the OEM can build on our digital chassis. So this is enabling him to get the latest features and performance right away. So you don't have to put together from different suppliers, different components. So it's really already a horizontally integrated platform and the OEM that can really focus on differentiating himself by software development, putting the right software strategy in place, having CI/CD processes and having always, let's say, updated and new functionality coming to the car. So there will not be anymore a car that comes with the specific functions and will be sold for five years. 
the car will be upgraded and updated over time and over lifetime. So we will see a clear change in the value chain of the suppliers in this automotive industry in the future. Paul, do you want to react to that? It is. I mean, it's definitely a partnership as opposed to a supplier, a traditional supplier relationship that has a firm end date, uh, you know, after you've started the production of the car. It's, you have to have that relationship in place for all the reasons which the other guys have said. They have to keep the software up to date. You have to keep the user experience up to date. And the most important thing, the cars are going to get safer as time goes on because everybody's learning about it all the time. And the cars are learning themselves and all of that information comes together with the software upgrade which should go into the cars as soon as it can. And it's not a one-time hit anymore. It's a continued partnership. And that is, the partnership is definitely a long-term partnership because as an OEM cannot afford to do what these guys do between all of their different customers. So what we have to do that is integrate that in the best way possible into a vehicle or into a service that brings the benefits. Okay, let's, let's talk about what you guys, what Qualcomm and NVIDIA do specifically. How important is the automotive industry for you guys as, as chip makers, as suppliers, as partners looking to your future business? That, it's a great question and it's, it's very important business to us. We've been working with automakers for well over two decades and um, it really spans everything from the design of vehicles, basically every vehicle is designed using NVIDIA technology, so the engineering, design, the artistic side, down to the, you know, the interiors, all that craftsmanship is designed um, on our technology. The testing and validation, uh, the layout of factories, um, and then there's what we're talking about with autonomous vehicles, that's one part, it's growing dramatically for us, but the technology starting in the data center, training, testing, validating, and then running in the vehicle uh, is a really large opportunity, and uh, we're really excited about it. Thomas, give us a Qualcomm perspective on this. We in Qualcomm have uh, more than 20 years uh, history in automotive business. Everything started around telematic services, uh, bringing online services to the drivers, having an exchange of information live while the car's on the road. In the past uh, 10 years, we have uh, created the user experience inside the car. We have been replacing, for example, the analog cluster, which is showing you the speed and the rounder parts of your engine by displays. And as you see, recently OEMs, premium OEMs, have announced the uh, displays going from the left side of your car to the right side of your car, replacing even mirrors by displays. So this is where we are helping the OEMs to create the user experience. And on top of that, we are enabling the OEMs to build a drive experience now, which is starting from assisted driving up to fully autonomous driving. So for Qualcomm, it's a super interesting field and a play field where we want to show our technology strength and enable the OEMs to bring the best technology to the market. Okay, let's talk for a second about user experience. Currently, different types of AVs exist. You've got AV pods for two or three people. You've got AV shuttles, eight plus people. Let's give each of you a chance to respond, but which design do we think is going to prevail in the cities of the future? Is it gonna differ by geography? What do you think? I, I think, think that the, the just, just like current, current cars, cars, you have different cars for different jobs. jobs. Yeah. You're yeah. going to have the same in robo taxis, robo shuttles, or autonomous driven vehicles. vehicles. There'll be people who there'll be mass transit, transit for example, where you'll have auto autonomous buses, buses or autonomous mini buses that drive, drive around at all at limited speeds, but improving the safety of those because they've also, also got to be safe as the cars. But also I also think that mobility as a service is going to play a really important part for the people who don't want to take those buses or it's not convenient for those to take those buses because they've got to go to a specific pickup point and a specific drop-off point. And I think it allows a lot more flexibility as mobility as a service, as the service grows and everything else, where you can be picked up from where you want to be picked up and dropped off where you want to be dropped off. And if you're used to driving around in a in, in a, a premium, premium vehicle, vehicle, for example, a Jaguar or, or an S-Class, you, you don't necessarily want to drop that standard just because you're in an autonomous vehicle. vehicle. So, so there's a top end of the market, the Stratus at the top, which people will still pay you over the odds or more than expected because they want that premium experience. And it's the experience between all those things. They all do the same job, roughly. They've all used the same technology. But the difference between each of those is the user experience and what that brings to the customer. What's your vision of the future? AV pods? You know, I, I think there's going to be a little bit of everything. And mm. if you look at the auto industry, just the whole transportation industry today, it's so fragmented. There's so many players, so many different brands, so many different flavors of vehicles. So um, we're working with hundreds of different companies, and it's all different types of car companies all over the world, um, from you know basic mainstream brands all the way up to, to the premium. 
Robo-taxi companies, I think there'll be a huge market for robo-taxis as well. Um, but even beyond that, there's all other types of vehicles. We're seeing a lot of activity using our technology for trucking, long haul trucking, hub to hub, last mile delivery, logistics. And so this problem of solving um, you know, AI challenges isn't just limited to consumer vehicles and passenger vehicles, but it really applies to everything that moves. And that's really what makes this so exciting. Is there potential for reduced costs here when we talk about autonomous vehicles? How, how does it make money? If labor costs are low, the driver's not that expensive, give me the business case. Why should I have an autonomous driver? An autonomous driver, the biggest saving is obviously the driver. No matter what market you're in, the biggest saving is the driver. The, the cost of the driver is always the biggest share in any taxi or anything that is driven by somebody else. But on top of that, the efficiencies which come from it's how we use our resources is one. So that autonomous car should replace between eight and 10 cars of privately owned cars. Because not only do you, while it's taking you to work every morning, for example, the rest, most traditional cars just sit in a car park and wait for you to come back in the evening. Mm -hmm. There's lots of other things that that car or that vehicle can be used for throughout the day, which takes something else off the road. So it's more about resources and, and being green, about being sensible and efficient in how we use our resources. There's actual efficiencies which come from most, most autonomous vehicles will be electric, for sure. And with that comes the efficiencies of the energy usage. But by being a robo-taxi or using a computer to drive the car, you haven't got the, the random inputs of what a human driver would use, for example, where you've got hard acceleration, hard braking, all that is under control. So you should have a much smoother ride, it may be a safer ride, it should be a more efficient ride in the amount of energy it uses from beginning to end. The lifetime of the vehicle, is another thing which really hurts in, in traditional cars. As soon as they leave the forecourt, they get worse. And with the ability to have over-the-air updates or to update the software reliably, these cars should get better. Mm. So, and they should continually get better until they, they're taken out of service. And the service is the key thing in this, because the service, they still need to be looked after because they've got to be safe. And you know, having the whole infrastructure that supports that mm. for mobility as a service is one of the key levers that makes these things viable. Do you see a role for yourself in that future? Oh, absolutely. I think the core technology and the foundation that all this is being built on uh, is AI, artificial intelligence. And NVIDIA is an AI company first. We're doing accelerated computing and that really uh, applies across the entire industry. Mm. Thomas, do you believe that in the future, all cars are gonna be equipped with AD hardware and software as standard, and then the functionality is just gonna be purchased as needed or updated as needed by the consumer? So definitely. So we in Qualcomm, we believe that the uh, take rate for our technology is increasing. I will certainly agree also with a statement that it will differ depending on what type of car you are going to sell. So there will be certainly, certainly entry cars which you are going to sell for basic features, basic assistance features, or going up to robo taxis. So this is why I believe that a fully scalable hardware and software platform is essential to address those OEMs needs. So we see OEMs who are building basic volume cars, which come with, let's say, lane departure features, keeping the, the car on the road, uh, going up to uh, autonomous driving cars where they can charge a premium to the uh, user of the car. So I would say, it will be everything. It will start from a basic feature set going up to the full L4 autonomous driving feature set. And therefore, a fully scalable platform is really key to achieve this. We've talked about how autonomous mobility has the potential for reduced costs. How much of those costs, though, are going to be passed on to the consumer? Will a future robo-taxi ride through Paris cost me less than a traditional taxi ride? It depending on the business model which you're looking at yeah. and depends where you are in the in the stratus of the market for example if you're in the premium end or if you're in the low end but you can make that choice as a user you know you can choose a premium car just like you can choose you know a premium car on another service and expect to pay a bit more but there's no reason why it should cost any more mm. than the current taxi service i think it has to be more affordable because otherwise consumers will just pick to have a driver in that vehicle the experience will be similar in that they don't have to, to drive themselves, right? And they can have the vehicles on demand. So uh, the, what we're working towards is delivering safer technology and make it more affordable and accessible. Do you agree that for the consumer, safer and more affordable is gonna be key, Thomas? What's, what's your view? Definitely, it has to be safer and it has to be more convenient. 
So even in my personal experience, I had taxi drivers where I had to tell them where to go. So I would love to say uh, on a map, I have to go to this destination and the car simply takes me there. So I would say it has to be more convenient, more safer, and then people get used to it because as I said, the hazard of finding a parking lot sometimes is uh, very large. So I would rather prefer to step in the car, go from A to B and step out of the car and enjoy my ride using my connectivity to all my social services and that will be fine then. Which use cases do you guys see the most potential for here? And I'm thinking private car, commercial people carriers, goods transport. What looks the best business model wise? I think in the near term, we're seeing a huge upswing in demand for trucking. Trucking. And, uh, and that's, that's a variety of different types of trucking, but uh, long haul trucks, hub to hub, uh, in ports and kind of closed environments. Um, we're already doing deployments today. Mm. And you think about what's happened in terms of internet commerce, in terms of more recently the pandemic, the increased need for shipping, couple that with driver shortages, huge demand for autonomous technology uh, in the commercial space. And, uh, and you're not having, your packages aren't complaining like potential customers would on early <laughs> technology, right? So I think that's, we're gonna see a much greater adoption first in the commercial space, and then it'll follow but uh, isn't, human passengers. Isn't that, isn't that much earlier adoption in the commercial space driven by the finances of the fact that the sensor suite is so expensive as well? Mm -hmm. As a percentage of the vehicle cost, for example, the sensor suite for, for a commercial vehicle is a much smaller percentage of the cost than it would be for a private car. So, and the use time goes up. Mm -hmm. So if a truck's not running, it doesn't right. earn no, money. There, there's a lot of reasons why we're, we're seeing that increased demand uh, on, the, on that trucking. And it's, it's both on-road and, and off-road. I mean, we're doing things in agriculture, in construction, in, in mining. So places where you really don't want to maybe even put humans at, at risk, we can have autonomous vehicles um, performing really valuable jobs there. Okay, as we, as we come to the end of part two of our talk, I want to give each of you a final statement, and I'm going to ask you to fill in the blank here. So the statement is, and Thomas, we'll start with you, the biggest untapped opportunity regarding autonomous driving is. Complete that sentence for me. I would say this is certainly the technology around uh, trucks. I would also concur here that the cost savings uh, in terms of people labor cost is certainly significant and pays back the investment for the higher technology cost. Uh, while on the volume side, of course, the passenger's car will be the leading technology because people will love uh, the features and will pay for them. Paul? The biggest untapped opportunity. The biggest untapped opportunity in autonomy at the moment is safety, in safety. my mind. Absolutely safety, and it's not just vehicle safety. It's about people getting into a car. I'll, I'll tell a story. Yeah. We tell our children all the time not to go away with strangers and get into strange cars and things. But what do we do every time we get into an Uber? We get into a car with a stranger. And this, the safety around all the other aspects of that, as well as the physical safety of the autonomy. And for me, there's much broader reaching safety factors, which are uh, followed by cost. Interesting perspective. Danny? No, I agree, safety, but I have a slightly different take in that, as we've said, the cars need to be safer than a human, but we need to be able to prove that they're safe. And so the key to do this is through testing and validating these cars, both on the road, but in the data center and through simulation. And so the more we can prove to regulators, the more we can prove to general consumers that these vehicles are safe, will then accelerate the adoption. So being able to test and validate in the virtual world is critical. All right, Danny, thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for being part of this panel on the future business models of autonomous driving. Thomas Danaman of Qualcomm, Danny Shapiro of NVIDIA, and Paul Thomas of Project 3. We appreciate your time and your contributions. And if you enjoyed learning more about the business models behind the future of autonomous driving, check out our other IAA Mobility Visionary Club chats. We are breaking down the future of autonomous driving from regulation to urban cityscapes to the nitty gritty of technology. I'll see you next time. Time.